twenty. The girl Helen. Giles and Gwenda had just finished breakfast on the morning after their return from Northumberland when Miss Marple was announced. She came rather apologetically. I'm afraid this is a very early call. Not a thing I am in the habit of doing. But there was something I wanted to explain. We're delighted to see you, said Giles, pulling out a chair for her. Do have a cup of coffee. Oh no, no, thank you, nothing at all. I have breakfasted most adequately. Now let me explain. I came in whilst you were away, as you kindly said I might, to do a little weeding. Angelic of you, said Gwenda. And it really did strike me that two days a week is not quite enough for this garden. In any case, I think Foster is taking advantage of you. Too much tea and too much talk. I found out that he couldn't manage another day himself, so I took it upon myself to engage another man just for one day a week, Wednesdays, today, in fact. Giles looked at her curiously. He was a little surprised. It might be kindly meant, but Miss Marple's action savored, very faintly, of interference. And interference was unlike her. He said slowly, Foster's far too old, I know, for really hard work. I'm afraid, Mr. Reed, that Manning is even older. Seventy-five, he tells me. But you see, I thought employing him, just for a few odd days, might be quite an advantageous move, because he used, many years ago, to be employed at Dr. Kennedy's. The name of the young man Helen got engaged to was Affleck, by the way. Miss Marple, said Giles, I maligned you in thought. You are a genius. You know I've got those specimens of Helen's handwriting from Kennedy? I know. I was here when he brought them. I'm posting them off today. I got the address of a good handwriting expert last week. Let's go into the garden and see Manning, said Gwenda. Manning was a bent, crabbed-looking old man with a roomy and slightly cunning eye. The pace at which he was raking a path accelerated noticeably as his employers drew near. Morning, sir. Morning, M.M. The lady said as how you could do with a little extra help of a Wednesday. I'll be pleased. Shameful neglected, this place looks. I'm afraid the garden's been allowed to run down for some years. It has that. Remember it, I do, in Mrs. Findison's time. A picture it were, then. Very fond of her garden she was, Mrs. Findison. Giles leaned easily against the roller. Gwenda snipped off some rose heads. Miss Marple, retreating a little upstage, bent to the bindweed. Old Manning leant on his rake. All was set for a leisurely morning discussion of old times and gardening in the good old days. I suppose you know most of the gardens round here, said Giles encouragingly. A.R., I know this place moderate well, I do. And the fancies people went in for. Mrs. Yule, up at Niagara, she had a yew hedge used to be clipped like a squirrel. Silly, I thought it. Peacocks is one thing and squirrels is another. Then Colonel Lampard, he was a great man for begonias. Lovely beds of begonias he used to have. Bedding out now, that's going out of fashion. I wouldn't like to tell you how often I've had to fill up beds in the front lawns and turf em over in the last six years. Seems people ain't got no eye for geraniums and a nice bit of lobelia edging no more. You worked at Dr. Kennedy's, didn't you? A are long time ago, that were. Must have been 1920 and on. He's moved now, given up. Young Dr. Brent's up at Crosby Lodge now. Funny ideas he has, little white tablets and so on. Vitipins he calls them. I suppose you remember Miss Helen Kennedy, the doctor's sister. A.R., I remember Miss Helen right enough. Pretty maid she was, with her long yellow hair. The doctor set a lot of store by her. Come back and lived in this very house here, she did, after she was married. Army gentleman from India. Yes, said Gwenda. We know. A.R. I did hear, Saturday night it was, as you and your us band was some kind of relations. Pretty as a picter, Miss Helen was, when she first come back from school. Full of fun, too. Wanting to go everywhere, dances and tennis and all that. Add to mark the tennis court, I add, hadn't been used for nigh twenty years, I'd say. And the shrubs overgrowing it cruel. Add to cut him back, I did. And get a lot of whitewash and mark out the lines. Lot of work it made, 
and in the end hardly played on. Funny thing I always thought that was. What was a funny thing? Asked Giles. Business with the tennis court. Someone come along one night and cut it to ribbons. Just to ribbons it was. Spite, as you might say. That was what it was, nasty bit of spite. But who would do a thing like that? That's what the doctor wanted to know. Proper put out about it he was, and I don't blame him. Just paid for it he had. But none of us could tell who'd done it. We never did know. And he said he wasn't going to get another. Quite right, too, for if it's spite one time, it would be spite again. But Miss Helen, she was rare and put out. She didn't have no luck, Miss Helen didn't. First that net, and then her bad foot. A bad foot? Asked Gwenda. Yes, fell over a scraper or some such and cut it. Not much more than a graze, it seemed, but it wouldn't heal. Fair worried about it, the doctor was. He was dressing it and treating it, but it didn't get well. I remember him saying I can't understand it. There must have been something spectic, or some word like that, on that scraper. And anyway, he says, what was the scraper doing out in the middle of the drive? Because that's where it was when Miss Helen fell over it, walking home on a dark night. The poor maid, there she was, missing going to dances and sitting about with her foot up. Seemed as though there was nothing but bad luck for her. The moment had come, Giles thought. He asked casually, Do you remember somebody called Affleck? A.R. You mean Jackie Affleck? As was in Fane and Watchman's office? Yes. Wasn't he a friend of Miss Helen's? That were just a bit of nonsense. Doctor put a stop to it, and quite right too. He wasn't any class, Jackie Affleck. And he was the kind that's too sharp by half. Cut themselves in the end that kind do. But he weren't here long. Got himself into hot water. Good riddance. Us don't want the likes of he and Dill mouth. Go and be smart somewhere else. That's what he were welcome to do. Gwenda said. Was he here when that tennis net was cut up? A.R. I see what you're thinking. But he wouldn't do a senseless thing like that. He were smart, Jackie Affleck were. Whoever did that it was just spite. Was there anybody who had a down on Miss Helen? Who would be likely to feel spiteful? Old Manning chuckled softly. Some of the young ladies might have felt spiteful all right. Not a patch on Miss Helen to look at, most of them weren't. No, I'd say that was done just in foolishness. Some tramp with a grudge. Was Helen very upset about Jackie Affleck? Asked Gwenda. Don't think as Miss Helen cared much about any of the young fellows. Just like to enjoy herself, that's all. Very devoted some of them were, young Mr. Walter Fane for one. Used to follow her round like a dog. But she didn't care for him at all? Not Miss Helen. Just laughed, that's all she did. Went abroad to foreign parts he did. But he come back later. Top one in the firm he is now. Never married. I don't blame him. Women causes a lot of trouble in a man's life. Are you married? Asked Gwenda. Buried too, I have. Said old Manning. A.R., well, I can't complain. Smoke me pipe in peace where I likes now. In the ensuing silence, he picked up his rake again. Giles and Gwenda walked back up the path towards the house and Miss Marple desisting from her attack on bind we joined them. Miss Marple, said Gwenda. You don't look well. Is there anything? It's nothing, my dear. The old lady paused for a moment before saying with a strange kind of insistence, You know, I don't like that bit about the tennis net. Cutting it to ribbons. Even then. She stopped. Giles looked at her curiously. I don't quite understand. He began. Don't you? It seems so horribly plain to me. But perhaps it's better that you shouldn't understand. And anyway, perhaps I am wrong. Now do tell me how you got on in Northumberland. They gave her an account of their activities, and Miss Marple listened attentively. It's really all very sad, said Gwenda. Quite tragic, in fact. Yes, indeed. Poor thing, poor thing. That's what I felt. How that man must suffer. He? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. But you meant. Well, yes, I was thinking of her, of the wife.
probably very deeply in love with him, and he married her because she was suitable, or because he was sorry for her, or for one of those quite kindly and sensible reasons that men often have, and which are actually so terribly unfair. I know a hundred ways of love, and each one makes the loved one rue, quoted Giles softly. Miss Marple turned to him. Yes, that is so true. Jealousy, you know, is usually not an affair of causes. It is much more, how shall I say, fundamental than that, based on the knowledge that one's love is not returned. And so one goes on waiting, watching, expecting that the loved one will turn to someone else. Which, again, invariably happens. So this Mrs. Erskine has made life a hell for her husband, and he, without being able to help it, has made life a hell for her. But I think she has suffered most. And yet, you know, I dare say he is really quite fond of her. He can't be, cried Gwenda. Oh, my dear, you are very young. He has never left his wife, and that means something, you know. Because of the children because it was his duty. The children, perhaps, said Miss Marple. But I must confess that gentlemen do not seem to me to have a great regard for duty in so far as their wives are concerned. Public service is another matter. Giles laughed. What a wonderful cynic you are, Miss Marple. Oh dear, Mr. Reed, I do hope not that. One always has hope for human nature. I still don't feel it can have been Walter Fane, said Gwenda thoughtfully and I'm sure it wasn't Major Erskine. In fact, I know it wasn't. One's feelings are not always reliable guides, said Miss Marple. The most unlikely people do things. Quite a sensation there was in my own little village when the treasurer of the Christmas club was found to have put every penny of the funds on a horse. He disapproved of horse racing and indeed any kind of betting or gambling. His father had been a turf agent and had treated his mother very badly, so, intellectually speaking, he was quite sincere. But he chanced one day to be motoring near Newmarket and saw some horses training. And then it all came over him, blood does tell. The antecedents of both Walter Fane and Richard Erskine seem above suspicion, said Giles gravely but with a slight amused twist to his mouth. But then murder is by way of being an amateur crime. The important thing is, said Miss Marple, that they were there. On the spot, Walter Fane was here in Dillmouth. Major Erskine, by his own account, must actually have been with Helen Halliday very shortly before her death, and he did not return to his hotel for some time that night. But he was quite frank about it. He... Gwenda broke off. Miss Marple was looking at her very hard. I only want to emphasize, said Miss Marple, the importance of being on the spot. She looked from one to the other of them. Then she said, I think you will have no trouble in finding out J. J. Affleck's address. As proprietor of the Daffodil Coaches, it should be easy enough. Giles nodded. I'll get onto it. Probably in the telephone directory. He paused. You think we should go and see him? Miss Marple waited for a moment or two, then she said. If you do, you must be very careful. Remember what that old gardener just said, Jackie Affleck is smart. Please, please be careful. 21. J. J. Affleck. I. J. J. Affleck, Daffodil Coaches, Devon and Dorset Tours, etc. had two numbers listed in the telephone book. An office address in Exeter and a private address on the outskirts of that town. An appointment was made for the following day. Just as Giles and Gwenda were leaving in the car, Mrs. Cocker ran out and gesticulated. Giles put on the brake and stopped. It's Dr. Kennedy on the telephone, sir. Giles got out and ran back. He picked up the receiver. Giles read here. Morning. I've just received rather an odd letter. From a woman called Lily Kimball. I've been racking my brains to remember who she is. Thought of a patient first. That put me off the scent. But I rather fancy she must be a girl who was in service once at your house house parlor maid at the time we know of. I'm almost sure her name was Lily, though I don't recollect her last name. There was a Lily. Gwenda remembers her. She tied a bow on the cat. 
Gwenny must have a very remarkable memory. Oh, she has. Well, I'd like to have a word with you about this letter, not over the phone. Will you be in if I come over? We're just on our way to Exeter. We could drop in on you if you prefer, sir. It's all on our way. Good. That'll do splendidly. I don't like to talk too much about all this over the phone, explained the doctor when they arrived. I always have an idea the local exchanges listen in. Here's the woman's letter. He spread the letter on the table. It was written on cheap lined paper in an uneducated hand. Dear Sir, Lily Kimball had written. I'd be grateful if you could give me advice about the enclosed what I cut out of paper. I've been thinking and I talked it over with Mr. Kimball, but I don't know what's best to do about it. Do you think as it means money or a reward because I could do with the money I'm sure but wouldn't want the police or anything like that? I often have been thinking about that night when Mrs. Halliday went away and I don't think sir she ever did because the clothes was wrong. I thought at first the master done it but now I'm not so sure because of the car I saw out of the window. A posh car it was and I seen it before but I wouldn't like to do anything without asking you first if it was all right and not police because I never have been mixed up with police and Mr. Kimball wouldn't like it. I could come and see you sir if I may next Thursday as it's market day and Mr. Kimball will be out. I'd be very grateful if you could. Yours respectfully. Lily Kimball. It was addressed to my old house in Dillmouth, said Kennedy, and forwarded on to me here. The cutting is your advertisement. It's wonderful, said Gwenda. This Lily, you see, she doesn't think it was my father who did it. She spoke with jubilation. Dr. Kennedy looked at her with tired, kindly eyes. Good for you, Gwenny, he said gently. I hope you're right. Now this is what I think we'd better do. I'll answer her letter and tell her to come here on Thursday. The train connection is quite good. By changing at Dillmouth Junction she can get here shortly after 4.30. If you two will come over that afternoon, we can tackle her all together. Splendid, said Giles. He glanced at his watch. Come on, Gwenda, we must hurry. We've got an appointment, he explained. With Mr. Affleck of the Daffodil Coaches, and so he told us, he's a busy man. Affleck? Kennedy frowned. Of course. Devon Turs and Daffodil Coaches, horrible great buttercolored brutes. But the name seemed familiar in some other way. Helen, said Gwenda. My goodness, not that chap? Yes. But he was a miserable little rat. So he's come up in the world. Will you tell me something, sir? said Giles. You broke up some funny business between him and Helen. Was that simply because of his, well, social position? Dr. Kennedy gave him a dry glance. I'm old-fashioned, young man. In the modern gospel, one man is as good as another. That holds morally, no doubt. But I'm a believer in the fact that there is a state of life into which you are born, and I believe you're happiest staying in it. Besides, he added, I thought the fellow was a wrong man, as he proved to be. What did he do exactly? That I can't remember now. It was a case, as far as I can recall, of his trying to cash in on some information obtained through his employment with Fane. Some confidential matter relating to one of their clients. Was he sore about his dismissal? Kennedy gave him a sharp glance and said briefly, Yes. And there wasn't any other reason at all for your disliking his friendship with your sister? You didn't think he was, well, odd in any way. Since you have brought the matter up, I will answer you frankly. It seemed to me, especially after his dismissal from his employment, that Jackie Affleck displayed certain signs of an unbalanced temperament. Incipient persecution mania, in fact. But that does not seem to have been borne out by his subsequent rise in life. Who dismissed him? Walter Fane? I have no idea if Walter Fane was concerned. He was dismissed by the firm. And he complained that he had been victimized? Kennedy nodded. I see. Well, we must drive like the wind. Till Thursday, sir. The house was newly built. It was of snow crete, heavily curved, with a big expanse of window. They were shown in through an opulent hall to a study half of which was taken up by a big chromium-plated desk. 
Gwenda murmured nervously to Giles. Really, I don't know what we should have done without Miss Marple. We lean upon her at every turn. First her friends in Northumberland and now her vicar's wife's boys club annual outing. Giles raised an admonitory hand as the door opened and J. J. Affleck surged into the room. He was a stout man of middle age, dressed in a rather violently checked suit. His eyes were dark and shrewd, his face rubicund and good-natured. He looked like the popular idea of a successful bookmaker. Mr. Reed? Good morning. Please to meet you. Giles introduced Gwenda. She felt her hand taken in a rather overzealous grip. And what can I do for you, Mr. Reed? Affleck sat down behind his huge desk. He offered cigarettes from an onyx box. Giles entered upon the subject of the boys' club outing. Old friends of his ran the show. He was anxious to arrange for a couple of days touring in Devon. Affleck replied promptly in a businesslike manner, quoting prices and making suggestions. But there was a faintly puzzled look on his face. Finally, he said, Well, that's all clear enough, Mr. Reed, and I'll send you a line to confirm it. But this is strictly office business. I understood from my clerk that you wanted a private appointment at my private address. We did, Mr. Affleck. There were actually two matters on which I wanted to see you. We've disposed of one. The other is a purely private matter. My wife here is very anxious to get in touch with her stepmother whom she has not seen for many years, and we wondered if you could possibly help us. Well, if you tell me the lady's name, I gather that I'm acquainted with her. You were acquainted with her at one time. Her name is Helen Halliday, and before her marriage she was Miss Helen Kennedy. Affleck sat quite still. He screwed up his eyes and tilted his chair slowly backwards. Helen Halliday, I don't recall. Helen Kennedy, formerly of Dillmouth, said Gwenda. The legs of Affleck's chair came down sharply. Got it, he said. Of course. His round Rubicon face beamed with pleasure. Little Helen Kennedy. Yes, I remember her. But it's a long time ago. Must be twenty years. Eighteen. Is it really? Time flies, as the saying goes. But I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed, Mrs. Reed. I haven't seen anything of Helen since that time. Never heard of her, even. Oh, dear, said Gwenda. That's very disappointing. We did so hope you could help. What's the trouble? His eyes flickered quickly from one face to another. Coral? Left home? Matter of money? Gwenda said. She went away, suddenly, from Dillmouth, eighteen years ago with, with someone. Jackie Affleck said amusedly. And you thought she might have gone away with me? Now why? Gwenda spoke boldly. Because we heard that you, and she, had once been, well, fond of each other. Me and Helen? Oh, but there was nothing in that. Just a boy and girl affair. Neither of us took it seriously, he added drilly. We weren't encouraged to do so. You must think us dreadfully impertinent, began Gwenda, but he interrupted her. What's the odds? I'm not sensitive. You want to find a certain person, and you think I may be able to help. Ask me anything you please. I've not to conceal. He looked at her thoughtfully. So you're Halliday's daughter? Yes. Did you know my father? He shook his head. I dropped in to see Helen once when I was over at Dillmouth on business. I'd heard she was married and living there. She was civil enough. He paused. But she didn't ask me to stay to dinner. No, I didn't meet your father. Had there, Gwenda wondered, been a trace of rancor in that. She didn't ask me to stay to dinner? Did she, if you remember, seem happy? Affleck shrugged his shoulders. Happy enough. But there, it's a long time ago. I'd have remembered if she'd looked unhappy. He added with what seemed a perfectly natural curiosity. Do you mean to say you've never heard anything of her since Dillmouth eighteen years ago? Nothing. No letters? There were two letters, said Giles but we have some reason to think that she didn't write them. You think she didn't write them? Affleck seemed faintly amused. Sounds like a mystery on the flicks. That's rather what it seems like to us. What about her brother, the doctor chap, 
Doesn't he know where she is? No. I see. Regular mystery, isn't it? Why not advertise? We have. Affleck said casually. Looks as though she's dead. You mightn't have heard. Gwenda shivered. Cold Mrs. Reed? No. I was thinking of Helen dead. I don't like to think of her dead. You're right there. I don't like to think of it myself. Stunning look she had. Gwenda said impulsively. You knew her. You knew her well. I've only got a child's memory of her. What was she like? What did people feel about her? What did you feel? He looked at her for a moment or two. I'll be honest with you, Mrs. Reed. Believe it or not, as you like. I was sorry for the kid. Sorry? She turned a puzzled stare on him. Just that. There she was, just home from school. Longing for a bit of fun like any girl might. And there was that stiff middle-aged brother of hers with his ideas about what a girl could do and couldn't do. No fun at all, that kid hadn't. Well, I took her about a bit, showed her a bit of life. I wasn't really keen on her, and she wasn't really keen on me. She just liked the fun of being a daredevil. Then of course they found out we were meeting and he put a stop to it. Don't blame him, really. Cut above me, she was. We weren't engaged or anything of that kind. I meant to marry sometime, but not till I was a good bit older. And I meant to get on and to find a wife who'd help me get on. Helen hadn't any money, and it wouldn't have been a suitable match in any way. We were just good friends with a bit of flirtation thrown in. But you must have been angry with the doctor. Gwenda paused and Affleck said, I was riled, I admit. You don't fancy being told you're not good enough. But there, it's no good being thin-skinned. And then, said Giles, you lost your job. Affleck's face was not quite so pleasant. Fired I was. Out of fame and watchman's. And I've a very good idea who was responsible for that. Oh? Giles made his tone interrogative, but Affleck shook his head. I'm not saying anything. I've my own ideas. I was framed, that's all, and I've a very fair idea of who did it. And why? The color suffused his cheeks. Dirty work, he said. Spying on a man, laying traps for him, lying about him. Oh, I've had my enemies all right. But I've never let them get me down. I've always given as good as I got. And I don't forget. He stopped. Suddenly his manner changed back again. He was genial once more. So I can't help you, I'm afraid. A little bit of fun between me and Helen, that was all. It didn't go deep. Gwenda stared at him. It was a clear enough story, but was it true? She wondered. Something Jared. It came to the surface of her mind what that something was. All the same, she said. You looked her up when you came to Dimmouth later. He laughed. You've got me there, Mrs. Reed. Yes, I did. Wanted to show her perhaps that I wasn't down and out just because a long-faced lawyer had pushed me out of his office. I had a nice business, and I was driving a posh car and I'd done very well for myself. You came to see her more than once, didn't you? He hesitated a moment. Twice, perhaps three times. Just dropped in. He nodded with sudden finality. Sorry I can't help you. Giles got up. We must apologize for taking up so much of your time. That's all right. Quite a change to talk about old times. The door opened and a woman looked in and apologized swiftly. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't know you had anyone. Come in, my dear, come in. Meet my wife. This is Mr. and Mrs. Reed. Mrs. Affleck shook hands. She was a tall, thin, depressed-looking woman dressed in rather unexpectedly well-cut clothes. Been talking over old times we have, said Mr. Affleck. Old times before I met you, Dorothy. He turned to them. Met my wife on a cruise, he said. She doesn't come from this part of the world. Cousin of Lord Poulterham's, she is. He spoke with pride, the thin woman flushed. They're very nice, these cruises, said Giles. Very educational said Affleck. Now, I didn't have any education to speak of. I always tell my husband we must go on one of those Hellenic cruises, 
said Mrs. Afflick. No time. I'm a busy man. And we mustn't keep you, said Giles. Goodbye and thank you. You'll let me know about the quotation for the outing? Affleck escorted them to the door. Gwenda glanced back over her shoulder. Mrs. Affleck was standing in the doorway of the study. Her face, fastened on her husband's back, was curiously and rather unpleasantly apprehensive. Giles and Gwenda said goodbye again and went towards their car. Bother, I've left my scarf, said Gwenda. You're always leaving something, said Giles. Don't look martyred. I'll get it. She ran back into the house. Through the open door of the study she heard Affleck say loudly, What do you want to come butting in for? Never any sense. I'm sorry, Jackie. I didn't know. Who are those people and why have they upset you so? They haven't upset me. I... He stopped as he saw Gwenda standing in the doorway. Oh, Mr. Affleck, did I leave a scarf? Scarf? No, Mrs. Reed, it's not here. Stupid of me. It must be in the car. She went out again. Giles had turned the car. Drawn up by the curb was a large yellow limousine resplendent with chromium. Some car, said Giles. A posh car, said Gwenda. Do you remember, Giles? Edith Paget, when she was telling us what Lily said. Lily had put her money on Captain Erskine, not our mystery man in the flashy car. Don't you see, the mystery man in the flashy car was Jackie Affleck? Yes, said Giles. And in her letter to the doctor Lily mentioned a posh car. They looked at each other. He was there, on the spot, as Miss Marple would say, on that night. Oh, Giles, I can hardly wait until Thursday to hear what Lily Kimball says. Suppose she gets cold feet and doesn't turn up after all? Oh, she'll come. Giles, if that flashy car was there that night. Think it was a yellow peril like this? Admiring my bus? Mr. Affleck's genial voice made them jump. He was leaning over the neatly clipped hedge behind them. Little Buttercup, that's what I call her. I've always liked a nice bit of bodywork. Hits you in the eye, doesn't she? She certainly does, said Giles. Fond of flowers I am, said Mr. Affleck. Daffodils, buttercups, calcellarias, they're all my fancy. Here's your scarf, Mrs. Reed. It had slipped down behind the table. Goodbye. Pleased to have met you. Do you think he heard us calling his car a yellow peril? Asked Gwenda as they drove away. Oh, I don't think so. He seemed quite amiable, didn't he? Giles looked slightly uneasy. Yes, but I don't think that means much. Giles, that wife of his, she's frightened of him. I saw her face. What? That jovial pleasant chap? Perhaps he isn't so jovial and pleasant underneath. Giles, I don't think I like Mr. Affleck. I wonder how long he'd been there behind us listening to what we were saying. Just what did we say? Nothing much, said Giles, but he still looked uneasy. 22. Lily keeps an appointment. Well, I'm damned, exclaimed Giles. He had just torn open a letter that had arrived by the after-lunch post and was staring in complete astonishment at its contents. What's the matter? It's the report of the handwriting experts, Gwenda said eagerly. And she didn't write that letter from abroad? That's just it, Gwenda. She did. They stared at each other. Gwenda said incredulously. Then those letters weren't a fake. They were genuine. Helen did go away from the house that night. And she did write from abroad. And she wasn't strangled at all? Giles said slowly. It seems so. But it really is very upsetting. I don't understand it. Just as everything seems to be pointing the other way. Perhaps the experts are wrong? I suppose they might be. But they seem quite confident. Gwenda, I really don't understand a single thing about all this. Have we been making the most colossal idiots of ourselves? All based on my silly behavior at the theater? I tell you what, Giles, let's call round on Miss Marple. We'll have time before we get to Dr. Kennedy's at 4.30. Miss Marple, however, reacted rather differently from the way they had expected. She said it was very nice indeed. But darling Miss Marple, said Gwenda, what do you mean by that? 
I mean, my dear, that somebody hasn't been as clever as they might have been. But how, in what way? Slipped up, said Miss Marple, nodding her head with satisfaction. But how? Well, dear Mr. Reed, surely you can see how it narrows the field. Accepting the fact that Helen actually wrote the letters, do you mean that she might still have been murdered? I mean that it seemed very important to someone that the letters should actually be in Helen's handwriting. I see. At least I think I see. There must be certain possible circumstances in which Helen could have been induced to write those particular letters. That would narrow things down. But what circumstances exactly? Oh, come now, Mr. Reed. You're not really thinking. It's perfectly simple, really. Giles looked annoyed and mutinous. It's not obvious to me, I can assure you. If you just reflect a little. Come on, Giles, said Gwenda. We'll be late. They left Miss Marple smiling to herself. That old woman annoys me sometimes, said Giles. I don't know now what the hell she was driving at. They reached Dr. Kennedy's house in good time. The doctor himself opened the door to them. I've let my housekeeper go out for the afternoon, he explained. It seemed to be better. He led the way into the sitting room where a tea tray with cups and saucers, bread and butter, and cakes was ready. Cup of tea's a good move, isn't it? He asked rather uncertainly of Gwenda. Put this Mrs. Kimball at her ease and all that. You're absolutely right, said Gwenda. Now what about you two? Shall I introduce you straight away? Or will it put her off? Gwenda said slowly. Country people are very suspicious. I believe it would be better if you received her alone. I think so too, said Giles. Dr. Kennedy said. If you were to wait in the room next door, and if this communicating door were slightly ajar, you would be able to hear what went on. Under the circumstances of the case, I think that you would be justified. I suppose it's eavesdropping, but I really don't care, said Gwenda. Dr. Kennedy smiled faintly and said, I don't think any ethical principle is involved. I do not propose, in any case, to give a promise of secrecy, though I am willing to give my advice if I am asked for it. He glanced at his watch. The train is due at Woodley Road at 4.35. It should arrive in a few minutes now. Then it will take her about five minutes to walk up the hill. He walked restlessly up and down the room. His face was lined and haggard. I don't understand, he said. I don't understand in the least what it all means. If Helen never left that house, if her letters to me were forgeries. Gwenda moved sharply, but Giles shook his head at her. The doctor went on. If Kelvin, poor fellow, didn't kill her, then what on earth did happen? Somebody else killed her, said Gwenda. But my dear child, if somebody else killed her, why on earth should Kelvin insist that he had done so? Because he thought he had. He found her there on the bed, and he thought he had done it. That could happen, couldn't it? Dr. Kennedy rubbed his nose irritably. How should I know? I'm not a psychiatrist. Shock? Nervous condition already? Yes, I suppose it's possible. But who would want to kill Helen? We think one of three people, said Gwenda. Three people? What three people? Nobody could have any possible reason for killing Helen unless they were completely off their heads. She'd no enemies. Everybody liked her. He went to the desk drawer and fumbled through its contents. He held out a faded snapshot. It showed a tall schoolgirl in a gym tunic, her hair tied back, her face radiant. Kennedy, a younger, happy-looking Kennedy, stood beside her, holding a terrier pup. Why? I've been thinking a lot about her lately, he said indistinctly. For many years I hadn't thought about her at all, almost managed to forget. Now I think about her all the time. That's your doing. His words sounded almost accusing. I think it's her doing, said Gwenda. He wheeled round on her sharply. What do you mean? Just that. I can't explain. But it's not really us. It's Helen herself. The faint melancholy scream of an engine came to their ears. Dr. Kennedy stepped out of the window, and they followed him. A trail of smoke showed itself retreating slowly along the valley. There goes the train, said Kennedy. Coming into the station?
No, leaving it. He paused. She'll be here any minute now. But the minutes passed and Lily Kimball did not come. Lily Kimball got out of the train at Dillmouth Junction and walked across the bridge to the siding where the little local train was waiting. There were few passengers, a half dozen at most. It was a slack time of day and in any case it was market day at Helchester. Presently the train started, puffing its way importantly along a winding valley. There were three stops before the terminus at Lonsbury Bay, Newton Langford, Matching's Halt, for Woodley Camp, and Woodley Bolton. Lily Kimball looked out of the window with eyes that did not see the lush countryside, but saw instead a Jacobean suite upholstered in jade green. She was the only person to alight at the tiny station of Matching's Halt. She gave up her ticket and went out through the booking office. A little way along the road a signpost with, to Woodley Camp, indicated a footpath leading up a steep hill. Lily Kimball took the footpath and walked briskly uphill. The path skirted the side of a wood, on the other side the hill rose steeply covered with heather and gorse. Someone stepped out from the trees and Lily Kimball jumped. My, you did give me a start, she exclaimed. I wasn't expecting to meet you here. Gave you a surprise, did I? I've got another surprise for you. It was very lonely in among the trees. There was no one to hear a cry or a struggle. Actually, there was no cry, and the struggle was very soon over. A wood pigeon, disturbed, flew out of the wood. What can have become of the woman? demanded Dr. Kennedy irritably. The hands of the clock pointed to ten minutes to five. Could she have lost her way coming from the station? I gave her explicit directions. In any case, it's quite simple. Turn to the left when she got out of the station, and then take the first road to the right. As I say, it's only a few minutes' walk. Perhaps she's changed her mind, said Giles. It looks like it. Or missed the train, suggested Gwenda. Kennedy said slowly. No, I think it's more likely that she decided not to come after all. Perhaps her husband stepped in. All these country people are quite incalculable. He walked up and down the room. Then he went to the telephone and asked for a number. Hello? Is that the station? This is Dr. Kennedy speaking. I was expecting someone by the 435. Middle-aged country woman. Did anyone ask to be directed to me? Or what do you say? The others were near enough to hear the soft, lazy accent of Woodley Bolton's one porter. Don't think as there could be anyone for you, doctor. We're no strangers on the 435. Mr. Narricott's from Meadows, and Johnny Laws, and old Benson's daughter. Weren't no other passengers at all. So she changed her mind, said Dr. Kennedy. Well, I can offer you tea. The kettle's on. I'll go out and make it. He returned with the teapot and they sat down. It's only a temporary check, he said more cheerfully. We've got her address. We'll go over and see her, perhaps. The telephone rang and the doctor got up to answer. Dr. Kennedy? Speaking. This is Inspector Lass, Longford Police Station. Were you expecting a woman called Lily Kimball, Mrs. Lily Kimball, to call upon you this afternoon? I was. Why? Has there been an accident? Not what you'd call an accident exactly. She's dead. We found a letter from you on the body. That's why I rang you up. Can you make it convenient to come along to Longford Police Station as soon as possible? I'll come at once. Now let's get this quite clear, Inspector Last was saying. He looked from Kennedy to Giles and Gwenda who had accompanied the doctor. Gwenda was very pale and held her hands tightly clasped together. You were expecting this woman by the train that leaves the mouth junction at 4.5? And gets to Woodley Bolton at 4.35? Dr. Kennedy nodded. Inspector Last looked down at the letter he had taken from the dead woman's body. It was quite clear. Dear Mrs. Kimball, Dr. Kennedy had written, I shall be glad to advise you to the best of my power. As you will see from the heading of this letter I no longer live in Dillmouth. If you will take the train leaving Kimballay at 3.30, change at Dillmouth Junction, and come by the Lonsbury Bay train to Woodley Bolton, my house is only a few minutes walk turn to the left as you come out of the station, then take the first road on the right. My house is at the end of it on the right.
The name is on the gate. Yours truly, James Kennedy. There was no question of her coming by an earlier train. An earlier train? Dr. Kennedy looked astonished. Because that's what she did. She left Kumbale, not at 3.30 but at 1.30, caught the 2.5 from Dimmouth Junction and got out, not at Woodley Bolton, but at Matching's Halt, the station before it. But that's extraordinary. Was she consulting you professionally, doctor? No. I retired from practice some years ago. That's what I thought. You knew her well? Kennedy shook his head. I hadn't seen her for nearly twenty years. But you, er, recognized her just now? Gwenda shivered, but dead bodies did not affect a doctor, and Kennedy replied thoughtfully. Under the circumstances it is hard to say if I recognized her or not. She was strangled, I presume? She was strangled. The body was found in a copse a short way along the track leading from Matching's Halt to Woodley Camp. It was found by a hiker coming down from the camp at about ten minutes to four. Our police surgeon puts the time of death at between 2.15 and 3 o'clock. Presumably she was killed shortly after she left the station. No other passenger got out at Matching's Halt. She was the only person to get out of the train there. Now why did she get out at Matching's Halt? Did she mistake the station? I hardly think so. In any case she was two hours early for her appointment with you, and had not come by the train you suggested, although she had your letter with her. Now just what was her business with you, doctor? Dr. Kennedy felt in his pocket and brought out Lily's letter. I brought this with me. The enclosed cutting and the insertion put in the local paper by Mr. and Mrs. Reed here. Inspector Lass read Lily Kimball's letter and the enclosure. Then he looked from Dr. Kennedy to Giles and Gwenda. Can I have the story behind all this? It goes back a long way, I gather. Eighteen years, said Gwenda. Piecemeal, with additions and parentheses, the story came out. Inspector Last was a good listener. He let the three people in front of him tell things in their own way. Kennedy was dry and factual. Gwenda was slightly incoherent, but her narrative had imaginative power. Giles gave, perhaps, the most valuable contribution. He was clear and to the point, with less reserve than Kennedy, and with more coherence than Gwenda. It took a long time. Then Inspector last sighed and summed up. Mrs. Halliday was Dr. Kennedy's sister, and your stepmother, Mrs. Reed. She disappeared from the house you are at present living in eighteen years ago. Lily Kimball, whose maiden name was Abbott, was a servant, house parlor maid, in the house at the time. For some reason Lily Kimball inclines, after the passage of years, to the theory that there was foul play. At the time it was assumed that Mrs. Halliday had gone away with a man, identity unknown. Major Halliday died in a mental establishment fifteen years ago still under the delusion that he had strangled his wife, if it was a delusion. He paused. These are all interesting but somewhat unrelated facts. The crucial point seems to be, is Mrs. Halliday alive or dead? If dead, when did she die? And what did Lily Kimball know? It seems, on the face of it, that she must have known something rather important. So important that she was killed in order to prevent her talking about it. Gwenda cried. But how could anyone possibly know she was going to talk about it, except us? Inspector Last turned his thoughtful eyes on her. It is a significant point, Mrs. Reed, that she took the 2-5 instead of the 4-5 train from Dillmouth Junction. There must be some reason for that. Also, she got out at the station before Woodley Bolton. Why? It seems possible to me that, after writing to the doctor, she wrote to someone else, suggesting a rendezvous at Woodley Camp, perhaps, and that she proposed after that rendezvous, if it was unsatisfactory, to go on to Dr. Kennedy and ask his advice. It is possible that she had suspicions of some definite person, and she may have written to that person hinting at her knowledge and suggesting a rendezvous. Blackmail, said Giles bluntly. I don't suppose she thought of it that way, said Inspector Last. She was just greedy and hopeful and a little muddled about what she could get out of it all. We'll see. Maybe the husband can tell us more. V. Warned her I did, said Mr. Kimball heavily. Don't have not to do with it, them were my words. Went behind my back, she did.
thought as she knew best. That were Lily all over. Too smart by half. Questioning revealed that Mr. Kimball had little to contribute. Lily had been in service at St. Catherine's before he met her and started walking out with her. Fond of the pictures, she was, and told him that likely as not, she'd been in a house where there'd been a murder. Didn't pay much account, I didn't. All imagination, I thought. Never content with plain fact, Lily wasn't. Long rigmarole, she told me, about the master doing in the missus and maybe putting the body in the cellar, and something about a French girl what had looked out of the window and seen something or somebody. Don't you pay no attention to foreigners, my girl, I said. One and all their liars. Not like us. And when she run on about it, I didn't listen because, mark you, she was working it all up out of nothing. Liked a bit of crime, Lily did. Used to take the Sunday news what was running a series about famous murderers. Full of it, she was, and if she liked to think she'd been in a house where there was a murder, well, thinking don't hurt nobody. But when she was on at me about answering this advertisement, you leave it alone, I says to her. It's no good stirring up trouble. And if she'd done as I told her, she'd be alive today. He thought for a moment or two. A.R., he said. She'd be alive right now. Too smart by half, that was Lily. Twenty-three. Which of them? Giles and Gwenda had not gone with Inspector Last and Dr. Kennedy to interview Mr. Kimball. They arrived home about seven o'clock. Gwenda looked white and ill. Dr. Kennedy had said to Giles, Give her some brandy and make her eat something, then get her to bed. She's had a bad shock. It's so awful, Giles, Gwenda kept saying. So awful. That silly woman, making an appointment with the murderer and going along so confidently, to be killed. Like a sheep to the slaughter. Well, don't think about it, darling. After all, we didn't know there was someone, a killer. No, we didn't. Not a killer now. I mean, it was then, eighteen years ago. It wasn't somehow quite real. It might all have been a mistake. Well, this proves that it wasn't a mistake. You were right all the time, Gwenda. Giles was glad to find Miss Marple at Hillside. She and Mrs. Cocker between them fussed over Gwenda who refused brandy because she said it always reminded her of channel steamers, but accepted some hot whiskey and lemon, and then, coaxed by Mrs. Cocker, sat down and ate an omelet. Giles would have talked determinately of other things, but Miss Marple, with what Giles admitted to be superior tactics, discussed the crime in a gentle aloof manner. Very dreadful, my dear she said. And of course a great shock, but interesting, one must admit. And of course I am so old that death doesn't shock me as much as it does you, only something lingering and painful like cancer really distresses me. The really vital thing is that this proves definitely and beyond any possible doubt that poor young Helen Halliday was killed. We thought so all along and now we know. And according to you we ought to know where the body is, said Giles. The cellar, I suppose. No, no, Mr. Reed. You remember Edith Paget said she went down there on the morning after because she was disturbed by what Lily had said, and she found no signs of anything of the kind, and there would be signs, you know, if somebody was really looking for them. Then what happened to it? Taken away in a car and thrown over a cliff into the sea? No. Come now, my dears, what struck you first of all when you came here? Struck you, Gwenda, I should say. The fact that from the drawing room window, you had no view down to the sea. Where you felt, very properly, that steps should lead down to the lawn, there was instead a plantation of shrubs. The steps, you found subsequently, had been there originally, but had at some time been transferred to the end of the terrace. Why were they moved? Gwenda stared at her with dawning comprehension. You mean that that's where? There must have been a reason for making the change, and there doesn't really seem to be a sensible one. It is, frankly, a stupid place to have steps down to the lawn, 
But that end of the terrace is a very quiet place. It's not overlooked from the house except by one window, the window of the nursery, on the first floor. Don't you see that if you want to bury a body the earth will be disturbed and there must be a reason for its being disturbed? The reason was that it had been decided to move the steps from in front of the drawing room to the end of the terrace. I've learned already from Dr. Kennedy that Helen Halliday and her husband were very keen on the garden and did a lot of work in it. The daily gardener they employed used merely to carry out their orders, and if he arrived to find that this change was in progress and some of the flags had already been moved, he would only have thought that the Hallidays had started on the work when he wasn't there. The body, of course, could have been buried at either place, but we can be quite certain, I think, that it is actually buried at the end of the terrace and not in front of the drawing room window. Why can we be sure? asked Gwenda. Because of what poor Lily Kimball said in her letter, that she changed her mind about the body being in the cellar because of what Leone saw when she looked out of the window. That makes it very clear, doesn't it? The Swiss girl looked out of the nursery window at some time during the night and saw the grave being dug. Perhaps she actually saw who it was digging it. And never said anything to the police? My dear, there was no question at the time of a crime having occurred. Mrs. Halliday had run away with a lover. That was all that Leone would grasp. She probably couldn't speak much English anyway. She did mention to Lily, perhaps not at the time, but later, a curious thing she had observed from her window that night, and that stimulated Lily's belief in a crime having occurred. But I've no doubt that Edith Paget told Lily off for talking nonsense, and the Swiss girl would accept her point of view and would certainly not wish to be mixed up with the police. Foreigners always seem to be particularly nervous about the police when they are in a strange country. So she went back to Switzerland and very likely never thought of it again. Giles said, If she's alive now, if she can be traced. Miss Marple nodded her head. Perhaps. Giles demanded. How can we set about it? Miss Marple said. The police will be able to do that much better than you can. Inspector Last is coming over here tomorrow morning. Then I think I should tell him, about the steps. And about what I saw, or think I saw, in the hall? Asked Gwenda nervously. Yes, dear. You've been very wise to say nothing of that until now. Very wise. But I think the time has come. Giles said slowly. She was strangled in the hall, and then the murderer carried her upstairs and put her on the bed. Kelvin Halliday came in, passed out with doped whiskey and in his turn was carried upstairs to the bedroom. He came to, and thought he had killed her. The murderer must have been watching somewhere near at hand. When Kelvin went off to Dr. Kennedy's, the murderer took away the body, probably hid it in the shrubbery at the end of the terrace and waited until everybody had gone to bed and was presumably asleep, before he dug the grave and buried the body. That means he must have been here, hanging about the house, pretty well all that night, Miss Marple nodded. He had to be, on the spot. I remember your saying that that was important. We've got to see which of our three S. Uspects fits in best with the requirements. We'll take Erskine first. Now he definitely was on the spot. By his own admission he walked up here with Helen Kennedy from the beach at round about nine o'clock. He said goodbye to her. But did he say goodbye to her? Let's say instead that he strangled her. But it was all over between them, cried Gwenda. Long ago. He said himself that he was hardly ever alone with Helen. But don't you see, Gwenda, that the way we must look at it now, we can't depend on anything anyone says. Now I'm so glad to hear you say that, said Miss Marple. Because I've been a little worried, you know, by the way you two have seemed willing to accept, as actual fact, all the things that people have told you. I'm afraid I have a sadly distrustful nature, but especially in a matter of murder, I make it a rule to take nothing that is told to me as true, unless it is checked. For instance, it does seem quite certain that Lily Kimball mentioned the clothes packed and taken away in a suitcase were not the ones Helen Halliday would herself have taken, because not only did Edith Paget tell us that Lily said so to her, but Lily herself mentioned the fact in her letter to Dr. Kennedy. So that is one fact. Dr. Kennedy told us that Kelvin Halliday believed that his wife was secretly drugging him, and Kelvin Halliday in his diary confirms that. So there is another fact, 
and a very curious fact it is, don't you think? However, we will not go into that now. But I would like to point out that a great many of the assumptions you have made have been based upon what has been told you, possibly told you very plausibly. Giles stared hard at her. Gwenda, her color restored, sipped coffee, and leaned across the table. Giles said, Let's check up now on what three people have said to us. Take Erskine first. He says, You've got a down on him, said Gwenda. It's waste of time going on about him, because now he's definitely out of it. He couldn't have killed Lily Kimball. Giles went on imperturbably. He says that he met Helen on the boat going out to India and they fell in love, but that he couldn't bring himself to leave his wife and children, and that they agreed they must say goodbye. Suppose it wasn't quite like that. Suppose he fell desperately in love with Helen, and that it was she who wouldn't run off with him. Supposing he threatened that if she married anyone else he would kill her. Most improbable, said Gwenda. Things like that do happen. Remember what you overheard his wife say to him. You put it all down to jealousy, but it may have been true. Perhaps she has had a terrible time with him where women are concerned. He may be a little bit of a sex maniac. I don't believe it. No, because he's attractive to women. I think myself that there is something a little queer about Erskine. However, let's go on with my case against him. Helen breaks off her engagement to Fane and comes home and marries your father and settles down here. And then suddenly Erskine turns up. He comes down ostensibly on a summer holiday with his wife. That's an odd thing to do, really. He admits he came here to see Helen again. Now let's take it that Erskine was the man in the drawing room with her that day when Lily overheard her say she was afraid of him. I'm afraid of you. I've always been afraid of you. I think you're mad. And because she's afraid, she makes plans to go and live in Norfolk, but she's very secretive about it. No one is to know. No one is to know, that is, until the Erskines have left Dillmouth. So far that fits. Now we come to the fatal night. What the Hallidays were doing earlier that evening we don't know. Miss Marple coughed. As a matter of fact, I saw Edith Paget again. She remembers that there was early supper that night, seven o'clock, because Major Halliday was going to some meeting, golf club, she thinks it was, or some parish meeting. Mrs. Halliday went out after supper. Right. Helen meets Erskine, by appointment, perhaps, on the beach. He is leaving the following day. Perhaps he refuses to go. He urges Helen to go away with him. She comes back here and he comes with her. Finally, in a fit of frenzy, he strangles her. The next bit is as we have already agreed. He's slightly mad. He wants Kelvin Halliday to believe it is he who has killed her. Later, Erskine buries the body. You remember, he told Gwenda that he didn't go back to the hotel until very late because he was walking about Dillmouth. One wonders said Miss Marple, what his wife was doing, probably frenzied with jealousy, said Gwenda, and gave him hell when he did get in. That's my reconstruction, said Giles, and it's possible. But he couldn't have killed Lily Kimball, said Gwenda, because he lives in Northumberland. So thinking about him is just waste of time. Let's take Walter Fane. Right. Walter Fane is the repressed type. He seems gentle and mild and easily pushed around. But Miss Marple has brought us one valuable bit of testimony. Walter Fane was once in such a rage that he nearly killed his brother. Admittedly, he was a child at the time, but it was startling because he had always seemed of such a gentle, forgiving nature. Anyway, Walter Fane falls in love with Helen Halliday. Not merely in love, he's crazy about her. She won't have him and he goes off to India. Later she writes him that she will come out and marry him. She starts. Then comes the second blow. She arrives and promptly jilts him. She has met someone on the boat. She goes home and marries Kelvin Halliday. Possibly Walter Fane thinks that Kelvin Halliday was the original cause of her turning him down. He broods, nurses a crazy jealous hate, and comes home. He behaves in a most forgiving, friendly manner, is often at this house, has become apparently a tame cat around the house, the faithful Dobbin. But perhaps Helen realizes that this isn't true. She gets a glimpse of what is going on below the surface.
Perhaps, long ago, she sensed something disturbing in quiet young Walter Fane. She says to him, I think I've always been afraid of you. She makes plans, secretly, to go right away from Dillmouth and live in Norfolk. Why? Because she's afraid of Walter Fane. Now we come again to the fatal evening. Here, we're not on very sure ground. We don't know what Walter Fane was doing that night, and I don't see any probability of ever finding out. But he fulfills Miss Marple's requirement of being on the spot to the extent of living in a house that is only two or three minutes walk away. He may have said he was going to bed early with a headache, or shut himself into his study with work to do, something of that kind. He could have done all the things we've decided the murderer did do, and I think that he's the most likely of the three to have made mistakes in packing a suitcase. He wouldn't know enough about what women wear to do it properly. It was queer, said Gwenda. In his office that day I had an odd sort of feeling that he was like a house with its blinds pulled down and I even had a fanciful idea that, that there was someone dead in the house. She looked at Miss Marple. Does that seem very silly to you? She asked. No, my dear. I think that perhaps you were right. And now, said Gwenda, we come to Affleck. Affleck's tours. Jackie Affleck who was always too smart by half. The first thing against him is that Dr. Kennedy believed he had incipient persecution mania. That is, he was never really normal. He's told us about himself and Helen, but we'll agree now that that was all a pack of lies. He didn't just think she was a cute kid, he was madly, passionately in love with her. But she wasn't in love with him. She was just amusing herself. She was man-mad, as Miss Marple says. No, dear. I didn't say that. Nothing of the kind. Well, a nymphomaniac if you prefer the term. Anyway, she had an affair with Jackie Affleck and then wanted to drop him. He didn't want to be dropped. Her brother got her out of her scrape, but Jackie Affleck never forgave or forgot. He lost his job, according to him through being framed by Walter Fane. That shows definite signs of persecution mania. Yes, agreed Giles. But on the other hand, if it was true, it's another point against Fane quite a valuable point. Gwenda went on. Helen goes abroad, and he leaves Dillmouth. But he never forgets her, and when she returns to Dillmouth, married, he comes over and visits her. He said first of all, he came once, but later on, he admits that he came more than once. And, oh Giles, don't you remember? Edith Paget used a phrase about our mystery man in a flashy car. You see, he came often enough to make the servants talk. But Helen took pains not to ask him to a meal, not to let him meet Kelvin. Perhaps she was afraid of him. Perhaps. Giles interrupted. This might cut both ways. Supposing Helen was in love with him, the first man she ever was in love with, and supposing she went on being in love with him. Perhaps they had an affair together, and she didn't let anyone know about it. But perhaps he wanted her to go away with him, and by that time she was tired of him and wouldn't go, and so, and so, he killed her. And all the rest of it. Lily said in her letter to Dr. Kennedy there was a posh car standing outside that night. It was Jackie Affleck's car. Jackie Affleck was on the spot, too. It's an assumption, said Giles. But it seems to me a reasonable one. But there are Helen's letters to be worked into our reconstruction. I've been puzzling my brains to think of the circumstances as Miss Marple put it, under which she could have been induced to write those letters. It seems to me that to explain them, we've got to admit that she actually had a lover, and that she was expecting to go away with him. We'll test our three possibles again. Erskine first. Say that he still wasn't prepared to leave his wife or break up his home, but that Helen had agreed to leave Kelvin Halliday and go somewhere where Erskine could come and be with her from time to time. The first thing would be to disarm Mrs. Erskine's suspicions, so Helen writes a couple of letters to reach her brother in due course which will look as though she has gone abroad with someone. That fits in very well with her being so mysterious about who the man in question is. But if she was going to leave her husband for him, why did he kill her? Asked Gwenda. Perhaps because she suddenly changed her mind. Decided that she did really care for her husband after all. He just saw red and strangled her.
Then, he took the clothes and suitcase and used the letters. That's a perfectly good explanation covering everything. The same might apply to Walter Fame. I should imagine that scandal might be absolutely disastrous to a country solicitor. Helen might have agreed to go somewhere nearby where Fane could visit her but pretend that she had gone abroad with someone else. Letters all prepared and then, as you suggested, she changed her mind. Walter went mad and killed her. What about Jackie Affleck? It's more difficult to find a reason for the letters with him. I shouldn't imagine that scandal would affect him. Perhaps Helen was afraid, not of him, but of my father, and so thought it would be better to pretend she'd gone abroad. Or perhaps Affleck's wife had the money at that time, and he wanted her money to invest in his business. Oh yes, there are lots of possibilities for the letters. Which one do you fancy, Miss Marple? Asked Gwenda. I don't really think Walter Fane, but then. Mrs. Cocker had just come in to clear away the coffee cups. There now, madam, she said. I quite forgot. All this about a poor woman being murdered and you and Mr. Reed mixed up in it. Not at all the right thing for you, madam, just now. Mr. Fane was here this afternoon, asking for you. He waited quite half an hour. Seemed to think you were expecting him. How strange, said Gwenda. What time? It must have been about four o'clock or just after. And then, after that, there was another gentleman, came in a great big yellow car. He was positive you were expecting him. Wouldn't take no for an answer. Waited twenty minutes. I wondered if you'd had some idea of a tea party and forgotten it. No, said Gwenda. How odd. Let's ring up Fane now, said Giles. He won't have gone to bed. He suited the action to the word. Hello, is that Fane speaking? Giles read here. I hear you came round to see us this afternoon. What? No, no, I'm sure of it. No, how very odd. Yes, I wonder, too. He laid down the receiver. Here's an odd thing. He was rung up in his office this morning. A message left would he come round and see us this afternoon. It was very important. Giles and Gwenda stared at each other. Then Gwenda said, Ring up Affleck. Again Giles went to the telephone, found the number and rang through. It took a little longer, but presently he got the connection. Mr. Affleck? Giles Reed I. Here he was obviously interrupted by a flow of speech from the other end. At last he was able to say, But we didn't, no, I assure you, nothing of the kind, yes, yes, I know you're a busy man. I wouldn't have dreamed of, yes, but look here, who was it rang you, a man, no, I tell you it wasn't me. No, no, I see. Well, I agree, it's quite extraordinary. He replaced the receiver and came back to the table. Well, there it is, he said. Somebody, a man who said he was me, rang up Affleck and asked him to come over here. It was urgent, big sum of money involved. They looked at each other. It could have been either of them, said Gwenda. Don't you see, Giles? Either of them could have killed Lily and come on here as an alibi. Hardly an alibi, dear, put in Miss Marple. I don't mean quite an alibi but an excuse for being away from their office. What I mean is, one of them is speaking the truth and one is lying. One of them rang up the other and asked him to come here, to throw suspicion on him, but we don't know which. It's a clear issue now between the two of them. Fane or Affleck? I say, Jackie Affleck? I think Walter Fane, said Giles. They both looked at Miss Marple. She shook her head. There's another possibility she said. Of course. Erskine. Giles fairly ran across to the telephone. What are you going to do? asked Gwenda. Put through a trunk call to Northumberland. Oh, Giles, you can't really think. We've got to know. If he's there, he can have killed Lily Kimball this afternoon. No private airplanes or silly stuff like that. They waited in silence until the telephone bell rang. Giles picked up the receiver. You were asking for a personal call to Major Erskine. Go ahead, please. Major Erskine is waiting. Clearing his throat nervously, Giles said, Air Erskine? Giles read here, read yes. He cast a sudden agonized glance at Gwenda which said as plainly as possible, 
What the hell do I say now? Gwenda got up and took the receiver from him. Major Erskine? This is Mrs. Reed here. We've heard of, of a house. Linscott Brake. Is, is it? Do you know anything about it? It's somewhere near you, I believe. Erskine's voice said. Linscott Brake? No, I don't think I've ever heard of it. What's the postal town? It's terribly blurred. Said Gwenda. You know those awful typescripts agents send out. But it says fifteen miles from Daith, so we thought. I'm sorry. I haven't heard of it. Who lives there? Oh, it's empty. But never mind, actually we've, we've practically settled on a house. I'm so sorry to have bothered you. I expect you were busy. No, not at all. At least only busy domestically. My wife's away. And our cook had to go off to her mother, so I've been dealing with domestic routine. I'm afraid I'm not much of a hand at it. Better in the garden. I'd always rather do gardening than housework. I hope your wife isn't ill. Oh no, she was called away to a sister. She'll be back tomorrow. Well, good night, and so sorry to have bothered you. She put down the receiver. Erskine is out of it, she said triumphantly. His wife's away and he's doing all the chores. So that leaves it between the two others. Doesn't it, Miss Marple? Miss Marple was looking grave. I don't think, my dears, she said, that you have given quite enough thought to the matter. Oh dear, I am really very worried. If only I knew exactly what to do. Twenty-four. The monkey's paws. Gwenda leaned her elbows on the table and cupped her chin in her hands while her eyes roamed dispassionately over the remains of a hasty lunch. Presently she must deal with them, carry them out to the scullery, wash up, put things away, see what there would be, later, for supper. But there was no wild hurry. She felt she needed a little time to take things in. Everything had been happening too fast. The events of the morning, when she reviewed them, seemed to be chaotic and impossible. Everything had happened too quickly and too improbably. Inspector Last had appeared early, at half past nine. With him had come Detective Inspector Primer from headquarters and the Chief Constable of the county. The latter had not stayed long. It was Inspector Primer who was now in charge of the case of Lily Kimball deceased and all the ramifications arising therefrom. It was Inspector Primer, a man with a deceptively mild manner and a gentle apologetic voice, who had asked her if it would inconvenience her very much if his men did some digging in the garden. From the tone of his voice, it might have been a case of giving his men some healthful exercise, rather than of seeking for a dead body which had been buried for eighteen years. Giles had spoken up then. He had said, I think, perhaps, we could help you with a suggestion or two. And he told the inspector about the shifting of the steps leading down to the lawn, and took the inspector out on to the terrace. The inspector had looked up at the barred window on T.H., he first floor at the corner of the house and had said, That would be the nursery, I presume. And Giles said that it would. Then the inspector and Giles had come back into the house, and two men with spades had gone out into the garden, and Giles, before the inspector could get down to questions, had said, I think, inspector, you had better hear something that my wife has so far not mentioned to anyone except myself, and or one other person. The gentle, rather compelling gaze of Inspector Primer came to rest on Gwenda. It was faintly speculative. He was asking himself, Gwenda thought, Is this a woman who can be depended upon, or is she the kind who imagines things? So strongly did she feel this, that she started in a defensive way. I may have imagined it. Perhaps I did. But it seems awfully real. Inspector Primer said softly and soothingly, well, Mrs. Reed, let's hear about it. And Gwenda had explained. How the house had seemed familiar to her when she first saw it. How she had subsequently learned that she had, in fact, lived there as a child. How she had remembered the nursery wallpaper, and the connecting door, and the feeling she had had that there ought to be steps down to the lawn. Inspector Primer nodded. He did not say that Gwenda's childish recollections were not particularly interesting but Gwenda wondered whether he were thinking it. Then she nerved herself to the final statement. 
How she had suddenly remembered, when sitting in a theater, looking through the banisters at hillside and seeing a dead woman in the hall. With a blue face, strangled, and golden hair, and it was Helen. But it was so stupid, I didn't know at all who Helen was. We think that. Giles began, but Inspector Primer, with unexpected authority, held up a restraining hand. Please let Mrs. Reed tell me in her own words. And Gwenda had stumbled on, her face flushed, with Inspector Primer gently helping her out, using a dexterity that Gwenda did not appreciate as the highly technical performance it was. Webster? he said thoughtfully. Hmm, Duchess of Malfi. Monkey's paws? But that was probably a nightmare, said Giles. Please, Mr. Reed. It may all have been a nightmare, said Gwenda. No, I don't think it was, said Inspector Primer. It would be very hard to explain Lily Kimball's death, unless we assume that there was a woman murdered in this house. That seemed so reasonable and almost comforting that Gwenda hurried on. And it wasn't my father who murdered her. It wasn't really. Even Dr. Penrose says he wasn't the right type, and that he couldn't have murdered anybody. And Dr. Kennedy was quite sure he hadn't done it, but only thought he had. So you see it was someone who wanted it to seem as though my father had done it, and we think we know who, at least it's one of two people. Gwenda, said Giles. We can't really. I wonder, Mr. Reed, said the inspector, if you would mind going out into the garden and seeing how my men are getting on. Tell them I sent you. He closed the French windows after Giles and latched them and came back to Gwenda. Now just tell me all your ideas, Mrs. Reed. Never mind if they are rather incoherent. And Gwenda had poured out all her and Giles's speculations and reasonings, and the steps they had taken to find out all they could about the three men who might have figured in Helen Halliday's life, and the final conclusions they had come to, and how both Walter Fane and Jay, Jay, Affleck had been rung up, as though by Giles, and had been summoned to Hillside the preceding afternoon. But you do see, don't you, Inspector, that one of them might be lying? And in a gentle, rather tired voice, the Inspector said, That's one of the principal difficulties in my kind of work. So many people may be lying. And so many people usually are. Though not always for the reasons that you'd think. And some people don't even know they're lying. Do you think I'm like that? Gwenda asked apprehensively, and the inspector had smiled and said, I think you're a very truthful witness, Mrs. Reed. And you think I'm right about who murdered her? The inspector sighed and said, It's not a question of thinking, not with us. It's a question of checking up. Where everybody was, what account everybody gives of their movements. We know accurately enough, to within ten minutes or so, when Lily Kimball was killed. Between 2.20 and 2.45. Anyone could have killed her and then come on here yesterday afternoon. I don't see, myself, any reason for those telephone calls. It doesn't give either of the people you mention an alibi for the time of the murder. But you will find out, won't you, what they were doing at the time. Between 2.20 and 2.45. You will ask them. Inspector Primer smiled. We shall ask all the questions necessary. Mrs. Reed, you may be sure of that. All in good time. There's no good in rushing things. You've got to see your way ahead. Gwenda had a sudden vision of patience and quiet, unsensational work. Unhurried, remorseless. She said, I see, yes. Because you're professional. And Giles and I are just amateurs. We might make a lucky hit, but we wouldn't really know how to follow it up. Something of the kind, Mrs. Reed. The inspector smiled again. He got up and unfastened the French windows. Then, just as he was about to step through them, he stopped. Rather, Gwenda thought, like a pointing dog. Excuse me, Mrs. Reed. That lady wouldn't be a Miss Jane Marple, would she? Gwenda had come to stand beside him. At the bottom of the garden Miss Marple was still waging a losing war with bindweed. Yes, that's Miss Marple. She's awfully kind in helping us with the garden. Miss Marple, said the inspector. I see. And as Gwenda looked at him inquiringly and said, She's rather a dear, he replied. She's a very celebrated lady, is Miss Marple. 
got the chief constables of at least three counties in her pocket. She's not got my chief yet, but I dare say that will come. So Miss Marple's got her finger in this pie. She's made an awful lot of helpful suggestions, said Gwenda. I bet she has, said the inspector. Was it her suggestion where to look for the deceased Mrs. Halliday? She said that Giles and I ought to know quite well where to look, said Gwenda. And it did seem stupid of us not to have thought of it before. The inspector gave a soft little laugh and went down to stand by Miss Marple. He said, I don't think we've been introduced, Miss Marple. But you were pointed out to me once by Colonel Melrose. Miss Marple stood up, flushed and grasping a handful of clinging green. Oh, yes. Dear Colonel Melrose. He has always been most kind. Ever since. Ever since a church warden was shot in the vicar's study. Quite a while ago. But you've had other successes since then. A little poison pen troubled down near Limstock. You seem to know quite a lot about me, Inspector. Primer, my name is. And you've been busy here, I expect. Well, I try to do what I can in the garden. Sadly neglected. This bindweed, for instance, such nasty stuff. Its roots, said Miss Marple, looking very earnestly at the inspector, go down underground a long way. A very long way. They run along underneath the soil. I think you're right about that, said the inspector. A long way down. A long way back, this murder, I mean. Eighteen years. And perhaps before that, said Miss Marple. Running underground. And terribly harmful, inspector, squeezing the life out of the pretty growing flowers. One of the police constables came along the path. He was perspiring and had a smudge of earth on his forehead. We've come to something, sir. Looks as though it's her all right. And it was then, Gwenda reflected, that the nightmarish quality of the day had begun. Giles coming in, his face rather pale, saying, It's, she's there all right, Gwenda. Then one of the constables had telephoned and the police surgeon, a short, bustling man, had arrived. And it was then that Mrs. Cocker, the calm and imperturbable Mrs. Cocker, had gone out into the garden, not led, as might have been expected, by ghoulish curiosity, but solely in the quest of culinary herbs for the dish she was preparing for lunch. And Mrs. Cocker, whose reaction to the news of a murder on the preceding day had been shock censure and an anxiety for the effect upon Gwenda's health, for Mrs. Cocker had made up her mind that the nursery upstairs was to be tenanted after the due number of months, had walked straight in upon the gruesome discovery, and had been immediately taken queer, to an alarming extent. Too horrible, madam. Bones is a thing I never could abide. Not skeleton bones, as one might say. And here in the garden, just by the mint and all. And my heart's beating at such a rate, palpitations, I can hardly get my breath. And if I might make so bold, just a thimbleful of brandy. Alarmed by Mrs. Cocker's gasps and her ashy color, Gwenda had rushed to the sideboard poured out some brandy and brought it to Mrs. Cocker to sip. And Mrs. Cocker had said, That's just what I needed, madam. When, quite suddenly, her voice had failed, and she had looked so alarming, that Gwenda had screamed for Giles, and Giles had yelled to the police surgeon. And it's fortunate I was on the spot, the latter said afterwards. It was touch and go any. Way. Without a doctor, that woman would have died then and there and then Inspector Primer had taken the brandy decanter, and then he and the doctor had gone into a huddle over it, and Inspector Primer had asked Gwenda when she and Giles had last had any brandy out of it. Gwenda said she thought not for some days. They'd been away, up north, and the last few times they'd had a drink, they'd had gin. But I nearly had some brandy yesterday, said Gwenda. Only it makes me think of channel steamers, so Giles opened a new bottle of whiskey. That was very lucky for you, Mrs. Reed. If you'd drunk brandy yesterday, I doubt if you would be alive today. Giles nearly drank some, but in the end he had whiskey with me. Gwenda shivered. Even now, alone in the house, with the police gone and Giles gone with them after a hasty lunch scratched up out of tins, since Mrs. Cocker had been removed to hospital, Gwenda could hardly believe in the morning turmoil of events. One thing stood out clearly— 
the presence in the house yesterday of Jackie Affleck and Walter Fane. Either of them could have tampered with the brandy, and what was the purpose of the telephone calls unless it was to afford one or other of them the opportunity to poison the brandy decanter? Gwenda and Giles had been getting too near the truth. Or had a third person come in from outside through the open dining room window perhaps, whilst she and Giles had been sitting in Dr. Kennedy's house waiting for Lily Kimball to keep her appointment? A third person who had engineered the telephone calls to steer suspicion on the other two. But a third person, Gwenda thought, didn't make sense. For a third person, surely, would have telephoned to only one of the two men. A third person would have wanted one suspect, not two. And anyway, who could the third person be? Erskine had definitely been in Northumberland. No, either Walter Fane had telephoned to Affleck and had pretended to be telephoned to himself. Or else Affleck had telephoned Fane and had made the same pretense of receiving a summons. One of those two, and the police, who were cleverer and had more resources than she and Giles had, would find out which. And in the meantime both of those men would be watched. They wouldn't be able to, to try again. Again Gwenda shivered. It took a little getting used to, the knowledge that someone had tried to kill you. Dangerous, Miss Marple had said long ago. But she and Giles had not really taken the idea of danger seriously. Even after Lily Kimball had been killed, it still hadn't occurred to her that anyone would try and kill her and Giles. Just because she and Giles were getting too near the truth of what had happened eighteen years ago. Working out what must have happened then, and who had made it happen. Walter Fane and Jackie Affleck. Which? Gwenda closed her eyes, seeing them afresh in the light of her new knowledge. Quiet Walter Fane, sitting in his office the pale spider in the center of its web. So quiet, so harmless looking. A house with its blinds down. Someone dead in the house. Someone dead eighteen years ago, but still there. How sinister the quiet Walter Fane seemed now. Walter Fane who had once flung himself murderously upon his brother. Walter Fane whom Helen had scornfully refused to marry, once here at home, and once again in India. A double rebuff. A double ignominy. Walter Fane, so quiet, so unemotional, who could express himself, perhaps, only in sudden murderous violence, as, possibly, quiet Lizzie Borden had once done. Gwenda opened her eyes. She had convinced herself, hadn't she, that Walter Fane was the man? One might, perhaps, just consider Affleck. With her eyes open, not shut. His loud check suit, his domineering manner, just the opposite to Walter Fane, nothing repressed or quiet about Affleck. But possibly he had put that manner on because of an inferiority complex. It worked that way, experts said. If you weren't sure of yourself, you had to boast and assert yourself, and be overbearing. Turned down by Helen because he wasn't good enough for her. The sore festering, not forgotten. Determination to get on in the world. Persecution. Everyone against him discharged from his employment by a fake charge made up by an enemy. Surely that did show that Affleck wasn't normal. And what a feeling of power a man like that would get out of killing. That good-natured, jovial face of his, it was a cruel face, really. He was a cruel man, and his thin, pale wife knew it and was afraid of him. Lily Kimball had threatened him and Lily Kimball had died. Gwenda and Giles had interfered. Then Gwenda and Giles must die, too and he would involve Walter Fane who had sacked him long ago. That fitted in very nicely. Gwenda shook herself, came out of her imaginings, and returned to practicality. Giles would be home and want his tea. She must clear away and wash up lunch. She fetched a tray and took the things out to the kitchen. Everything in the kitchen was exquisitely neat. Mrs. Cocker was really a treasure. By the side of the sink was a pair of surgical rubber gloves. Mrs. Cocker always wore a pair for washing up. Her niece, who worked in a hospital, got them at a reduced price. Gwenda fitted them on over her hands and began to wash up the dishes. She might as well keep her hands nice. She washed the plates and put them in the rack, washed and dried the other things and put everything neatly away. Then, still lost in thought, she went upstairs. She might as well, she thought, wash out those stockings and a jumper or two 
she'd keep the gloves on. These things were in the forefront of her mind. But somewhere, underneath them, something was nagging at her. Walter Fane or Jackie Affleck, she had said, one or the other of them. And she had made out quite a good case against either of them. Perhaps that was what really worried her. Because, strictly speaking, it would be much more satisfactory if you could only make out a good case against one of them. One ought to be sure by now, which... And Gwenda wasn't sure. If only there was someone else. But there couldn't be anyone else. Because Richard Erskine was out of it. Richard Erskine had been in Northumberland when Lily Kimball was killed and when the brandy in the decanter had been tampered with. Yes, Richard Erskine was right out of it. She was glad of that, because she liked Richard Erskine. Richard Erskine was attractive, very attractive. How sad for him to be married to that megalith of a woman with her suspicious eyes and deep bass voice. Just like a man's voice. Like a man's voice. The idea flashed through her mind with a queer misgiving. A man's voice. Could it have been Mrs. Erskine, not her husband, who had replied to Giles on the telephone last night? No, no, surely not. No, of course not. She and Giles would have known. And anyway, to begin with, Mrs. Erskine could have had no idea of who was ringing up. No, of course it was Erskine speaking, and his wife, as he said, was away. His wife was away. Surely, no, that was impossible. Could it have been Mrs. Erskine? Mrs. Erskine, driven insane by jealousy? Mrs. Erskine to whom Lily Kimball had written? Was it a woman Leone had seen in the garden that night when she looked out of the window? There was a sudden bang in the hall below. Somebody had come in through the front door. Gwenda came out from the bathroom onto the landing and looked over the banisters. She was relieved to see it was Dr. Kennedy. She called down. I'm here. Her hands were held out in front of her. Wet, glistening, a queer pinkish gray. They reminded her of something. Kennedy looked up, shading his eyes. Is that you, Gwenny? I can't see your face. My eyes are dazzled. And then Gwenda screamed. Looking at those smooth monkey's paws and hearing that voice in the hall. It was you. She gasped. You killed her, killed Helen. I know now. It was you, all along. You. He came up the stairs towards her. Slowly. Looking up at her. Why couldn't you leave him? E alone? He said. Why did you have to meddle? Why did you have to bring her back? Just when I'd begun to forget, to forget. You brought her back again, Helen, my Helen bringing it all up again. I had to kill Lily. Now I'll have to kill you. Like I killed Helen. Yes, like I killed Helen. He was close upon her now, his hands out towards her, reaching, she knew, for her throat. That kind, quizzical face, that nice, ordinary, elderly face, the same still, but for the eyes, the eyes were not sane. Gwenda retreated before him, slowly, the scream frozen in her throat. She had screamed once. She could not scream again. And if she did scream, no one would hear. Because there was no one in the house, not Giles, and not Mrs. Cocker, not even Miss Marple in the garden. Nobody. And the house next door was too far away to hear if she screamed. And anyway, she couldn't scream. Because she was too frightened to scream. Frightened of those horrible reaching hands. She could back away to the nursery door and then... And then, those hands would fasten round her throat. A pitiful little stifled whimper came from between her lips. And then, suddenly, Dr. Kennedy stopped and reeled back as a jet of soapy water struck him between the eyes. He gasped and blinked and his hands went to his face. So fortunate, said Miss Marple's voice, rather breathless, for she had run violently up the back stairs. That I was just syringing the green fly off your roses. 25. Postscript at Torquay. But, of course, dear Gwenda, I should never have dreamed of going away and leaving you alone in the house, said Miss Marple. I knew there was a very dangerous person at large, and I was keeping an unobtrusive watch from the garden. Did you know it was him all along? asked Gwenda. They were all three, Miss Marple, Gwenda and Giles, 
sitting on the terrace of the Imperial Hotel at Torquay. A change of scene, Miss Marple had said, and Giles had agreed, would be the best thing for Gwenda. So Inspector Primer had concurred and they had driven to Torquay forthwith. Miss Marple said in answer to Gwenda's question, Well, he did seem indicated, my dear. Although unfortunately there was nothing in the way of evidence to go upon. Just indications, nothing more. Looking at her curiously, Giles said, But I can't see any indications even. Oh dear, Giles, think. He was on the spot to begin with. On the spot? But certainly. When Kelvin Halliday came to him that night he had just come back from the hospital. And the hospital, at that time, as several people told us, was actually next door to Hillside, or St. Catherine's as it was then called. So that, as you see, puts him in the right place at the right time. And then there were a hundred and one little significant facts. Helen Halliday told Richard Erskine she had gone out to marry Walter Fane because she wasn't happy at home. Not happy, that is, living with her brother. Yet her brother was by all accounts devoted to her. So why wasn't she happy? Mr. Affleck told you that he was sorry for the poor kid. I think that he was absolutely truthful when he said that. He was sorry for her. Why did she have to go and meet young Affleck in that clandestine way? Admittedly, she was not wildly in love with him. Was it because she couldn't meet young men in the ordinary normal way? Her brother was strict and old-fashioned. It is vaguely reminiscent, is it not, of Mr. Barrett of Wimpole Street? Gwenda shivered. He was mad, she said. Mad? Yes, said Miss Marple. He wasn't normal. He adored his half-sister, and that affection became possessive and unwholesome. That kind of thing happens oftener than you'd think. Fathers who don't want their daughters to marry, or even to meet young men. Like Mr. Barrett. I thought of that when I heard about the tennis net. The tennis net? Yes, that seemed to me very significant. Think of that girl, young Helen, coming home from school, and eager for all a young girl wants out of life, anxious to meet young men, to flirt with them. A little sex crazy. No said Miss Marple with emphasis. That is one of the wickedest things about this crime. Dr. Kennedy didn't only kill her physically. If you think back carefully, you'll see that the only evidence for Helen Kennedy's having been man-mad or practically, what is the word you use, dear? Oh yes, a nymphomaniac, came actually from Dr. Kennedy himself. I think myself, that she was a perfectly normal young girl who wanted to have fun and a good time and flirt a little and finally settle down with the man of her choice, no more than that, and see what steps her brother took. First he was strict and old-fashioned about allowing her liberty. Then, when she wanted to give tennis parties, a most normal and harmless desire, he pretended to agree and then one night secretly cut the tennis net to ribbons, a very significant and sadistic action. Then, since she could still go out to play tennis or to dances, he took advantage of a grazed foot which he treated, to infect it so that it wouldn't heal. Oh yes, I think he did that. In fact, I'm sure of it. Mind you, I don't think Helen realized any of all this. She knew her brother had a deep affection for her, and I don't think she knew why she felt uneasy and unhappy at home. But she did feel like that, and at last she decided to go out to India and marry young Fane simply in order to get away. To get away from what? She didn't know. She was too young and guileless to know. So she went off to India and on the way she met Richard Erskine and fell in love with him. There again, she behaved not like a sex-crazy girl, but like a decent and honorable girl. She didn't urge him to leave his wife. She urged him not to do so. But when she saw Walter Fane she knew that she couldn't marry him, and because she didn't know what else to do, she wired her brother for money to go home. On the way home she met your father, and another way of escape showed itself. This time it was one with good prospect of happiness. She didn't marry your father under false pretenses, Gwenda. He was recovering from the death of a dearly loved wife. She was getting over an unhappy love affair. They could both help each other. I think it is significant that she and Kelvin Halliday were married in London and then went down to Dimmouth to break the news to Dr. Kennedy. She must have had some instinct that that would be a wiser thing to do than to go down and be married in Dimmouth. 
which ordinarily would have been the normal thing to do. I still think she didn't know what she was up against, but she was uneasy, and she felt safer in presenting her brother with the marriage as a fait accompli. Kelvin Halliday was very friendly to Kennedy and liked him. Kennedy seems to have gone out of his way to appear pleased about the marriage. The couple took a furnished house there. And now we come to that very significant fact, the suggestion that Kelvin was being drugged by his wife. There are only two possible explanations of that, because there are only two people who could have had the opportunity of doing such a thing. Either Helen Halliday was drugging her husband, and if so, why? Or else the drugs were being administered by Dr. Kennedy. Kennedy was Halliday's physician as is clear by Halliday's consulting him. He had confidence in Kennedy's medical knowledge, and the suggestion that his wife was drugging him was very cleverly put to him by Kennedy. But could any drug make a man have the hallucination that he was strangling his wife? asked Giles. I mean there isn't any drug, is there, that has that particular effect? My dear Giles, you've fallen into the trap again, the trap of believing what is said to you. There is only Dr. Kennedy's word for it that Halliday ever had that hallucination. He himself never says so in his diary. He had hallucinations, yes, but he does not mention their nature. But I dare say Kennedy talked to him about men who had strangled their wives after passing through a phase such as Kelvin Halliday was experiencing. Dr. Kennedy was really wicked, said Gwenda. I think, said Miss Marple, that he definitely passed the borderline between sanity and madness by that time. And Helen, poor girl, began to realize it. It was to her brother she must have been speaking that day when she was overheard by Lily. I think I've always been afraid of you. That was one of the things she said. And that always was very significant. And so she determined to leave Dillmouth. She persuaded her husband to buy a house in Norfolk. She persuaded him not to tell anyone about it. The secrecy about it was very illuminating. She was clearly very afraid of someone knowing about it. But that did not fit in with the Walter Fane theory or the Jackie Affleck theory, and certainly not with Richard Erskine's being concerned. No, it pointed to somewhere much nearer home. And in the end, Kelvin Halliday, whom doubtless the secrecy irked and who felt it to be pointless, told his brother-in-law, and in so doing, sealed his own fate and that of his wife. For Kennedy was not going to let Helen go and live happily with her husband. I think perhaps his idea was simply to break down Halliday's health with drugs. But at the revelation that his victim and Helen were going to escape him, he became completely unhinged. From the hospital he went through into the garden of St. Catherine's, and he took with him a pair of surgical gloves. He caught Helen in the hall, and he strangled her. Nobody saw him, there was no one there to see him, or so he thought, and so, racked with love and frenzy, he quoted those tragic lines that were so apposite. Miss Marple sighed and clucked her tongue. I was stupid, very stupid. We were all stupid. We should have seen at once. Those lines from the Duchess of Malfi were really the clue to the whole thing. They are said, are they not, by a brother who has just contrived his sister's death to avenge her marriage to the man she loved. Yes, we were stupid. And then? asked Giles and then he went through with the whole devilish plan. The body carried upstairs. The clothes packed in a suitcase. A note, written and thrown in the waste paper basket to convince Halliday later. But I should have thought, sigh. De Gwenda, that it would have been better from his point of view for my father actually to have been convicted of the murder. Miss Marple shook her head. Oh no, he couldn't risk that. He had a lot of shrewd Scottish common sense, you know. He had a wholesome respect for the police. The police take a lot of convincing before they believe a man guilty of murder. The police might have asked a lot of awkward questions and made a lot of awkward inquiries as to times and places. No, his plan was simpler, and I think more devilish. He only had Halliday to convince. First, that he had killed his wife. Secondly, that he was mad. He persuaded Halliday to go into a mental home but I don't think he really wanted to convince him that it was all a delusion. Your father accepted that theory, Gwenny, mainly, I should imagine, for your sake. He continued to believe that he had killed Helen. He died believing that. Wicked, said Gwenda. Wicked, wicked, 
wicked. Yes, said Miss Marple. There isn't really any other word. And I think, Gwenda, that that is why your childish impression of what you saw remained so strong. It was real evil that was in the air that night. But the letters, said Giles. Helen's letters? They were in her handwriting, so they couldn't be forgeries. Of course they were forgeries. But that is where he overreached himself. He was so anxious, you see, to stop you and Giles making investigations. He could probably imitate Helen's handwriting quite nicely, but it wouldn't fool an expert. So the sample of Helen's handwriting he sent you with the letter wasn't her handwriting either. He wrote it himself. So naturally it tallied. Goodness, said Giles. I never thought of that. No, said Miss Marple. You believed what he said. It really is very dangerous to believe people. I never have for years. And the brandy? He did that the day he came to Hillside with Helen's letter and talked to me in the garden. He was waiting in the house while Mrs. Cocker came out and told me he was there. It would only take a minute. Good Lord, said Giles. And he urged me to take Gwenda home and give her brandy after we were at the police station when Lily Kimball was killed. How did he arrange to meet her earlier? That was very simple. The original letter he sent her asked her to meet him at Woodley Camp and come to Matching's Halt by the 2-5 train from Dillmouth Junction. He came out of the copse of trees, probably, and accosted her, as she was going up the lane, and strangled her. Then he simply substituted the letter you all saw for the letter she had with her, and which he had asked her to bring because of the directions in it, and went home to prepare for you and play out the little comedy of waiting for Lily. And Lily really was threatening him? Her letter didn't sound as though she was. Her letter sounded as though she suspected Affleck. Perhaps she did. But Leone, the Swiss girl, had talked to Lily, and Leone was the one danger to Kennedy. Because she looked out of the nursery window and saw him digging in the garden. In the morning he talked to her, told her bluntly that Major Halliday had killed his wife, that Major Halliday was insane, and that he, Kennedy, was hushing up the matter for the child's sake. If, however, Leone felt she ought to go to the police, she must do so, but it would be very unpleasant for her, and so on. Leone took immediate fright at the mention of the police. She adored you and had implicit faith in what M. the doctor thought best. Kennedy paid her a handsome sum of money and hustled her back to Switzerland. But before she went, she hinted something to Lily as to your father's having killed his wife and that she had seen the body buried. That fitted in with Lily's ideas at the time. She took it for granted that it was Calvin Halliday Leone had seen digging the grave. But Kennedy didn't know that, of course, said Gwenda. Of course not. When he got Lily's letter the words in it that frightened him were that Leone had told Lily what she had seen out of the window and the mention of the car outside. The car? Jackie Affleck's car? Another misunderstanding. Lily remembered or thought she remembered, a car like Jackie Affleck's being outside in the road. Already her imagination had got to work on the mystery man who came over to see Mrs. Halliday. With the hospital next door, no doubt a good many cars did park along this road. But you must remember that the doctor's car was actually standing outside the hospital that night. He probably leaped to the conclusion that she meant his car. The adjective posh was meaningless to him. I see, said Giles. Yes, to a guilty conscience that letter of Lily's might look like blackmail. But how do you know all about Leone? Her lips pursed close together, Miss Marple said. He went, right over the edge, you know. As soon as the men Inspector Primer had left Rushton and seized him, he went over the whole crime again and again, everything he'd done. Leone died, it seems, very shortly after her return to Switzerland. Overdose of some sleeping tablets. Oh no. He wasn't taking any chances. Like trying to poison me with the brandy. You were very dangerous to him, you and Giles. Fortunately you never told him about your memory of seeing Helen dead in the hall. He never knew there had been an eyewitness. Those telephone calls to Fane and Affleck. Said Giles. Did he put those through? Yes. If there was an inquiry as to who could have tampered with the brandy, either of them would make an admirable suspect and if Jackie Affleck drove over in his car alone, it might tie him in with Lily Kimball's murder. 
Fane would most likely have an alibi. And he seemed fond of me, said Gwenda. Little Gwenny. He had to play his part, said Miss Marple. Imagine what it meant to him. After eighteen years, you and Giles come along, asking questions, burrowing into the past, disturbing a murder that had seemed dead but was only sleeping. Murder in retrospect. A horribly dangerous thing to do, my dears. I have been sadly worried. Per Mrs. Cocker, said Gwenda. She had a terribly near escape. I'm glad she's going to be all right. Do you think she'll come back to us, Giles? After all this? She will if there's a nursery, said Giles gravely, and Gwenda blushed, and Miss Marple smiled a little and looked out across Torbay. How very odd it was that it should happen the way it did, mused Gwenda. My having those rubber gloves on, and looking at them, and then his coming into the hall and saying those words that sounded so like the others. Face, and then eyes dazzled. She shuddered. Cover her face. Mine eyes dazzle. She died young. That might have been me, if Miss Marple hadn't been there. She paused and said softly, Poor Helen. Poor lovely Helen, who died young. You know, Giles, she isn't there anymore, in the house, in the hall. I could feel that yesterday before we left. There's just the house. And the house is fond of us. We can go back if we like. The end. See you in another video. Please do not forget to like the video and subscribe.